Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, President's Distinguished Speakers Series. I'm Toby Herzog, uh, Emeritus Professor of English. Um, today is Ben Kesseling's big day, and it began this morning in an amazing way. He had breakfast with President Feller in Sparks, <laughs> eating, eating Scott's favorite breakfast, biscuits and gravy. And the day has just gotten better from that point on, including Ben's chapel talk, which was thought-provoking, just one of the best chapel talks I've, I've heard, um, talking to our students about calibrating their moral compass. And it was, it was a message that all of our students and all of us need to hear. So tonight we celebrate Wabash Loyal son, Ben Kessling, a 2002 graduate who embodies a liberal arts education and a liberal arts life. Wabash religion major, Master of Divinity degree from Harvard, Marine Corps infantry officer with deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And as mentioned in every bio of Ben, two-time Jeopardy champ, which is perhaps for some the epitome of a liberal arts education. So all of you students out there, if you want to get on Jeopardy, just take a lot of classes here, broadly across all divisions. Here are a few of Ben's other achievements at Wabash. Fearless rugby player, author of humorous and satiric all-campus email blasts, that were signed the voice of the common man. Daredevil jumper from the second floor of the old Sigma Chi house onto mattresses while wearing his rugby helmet. Heckler of Bill Maher during the comedian's presentation in our own ball theater. And afterward, Bill said, I'm never coming back to Crawfordsville. And he's shown such restraint never to come back to Crawford, so I can't imagine how, how he could avoid doing that. And, of course, as perfect training for a military career, participant in the 1998 Halloween heist of the Monon Bell. Tonight, as part of the next phase of his liberal arts life, author Ben will read from his just published nonfiction book, Bravo Company, an Afghanistan deployment and its aftermath. As a Vietnam veteran and teacher of war literature, I found this book to ring true, not only for the men of Bravo Company and their families, but for the combatants and their families involved in any war. This is a book that only someone with Ben's multifaceted background and experiences could write. What is so stunning about the book is the multiplicity of voices present in Ben's telling of Bravo Company's story. Of course, the poignant words of the soldiers, veterans, and families of Bravo are crucial but also important are Ben's own storyteller voices, the infantry officer who has fought and led, the reporter who has covered the military and veterans affairs, the political and military analyst, commentator, and of course the liberal arts divinity graduate who is able to weave into his history of Bravo Company an amazing number of relevant references to literature history, politics, philosophy, psychology, classics, religion, and pop culture. At times, Ben's voice is that of the knowledgeable reporter, educating the reader by providing context for the story, 
through background material about history, war, and military bureaucracy. At other times, Ben's voice is that of an iconoclast new journalist who through language, tone, cadence, conversational style, and pop culture references signals to the reader that this book is not the conventional reporting about the war in Afghanistan and its aftermath. Just as freelance reporter Michael Hur did 45 years earlier with his Vietnam classic dispatches, Ben presents a view of war that's personal, that's meaningful for any reader. Finally, I sometimes found the voice of Marine Corps Infantry Officer Ben Kessley subtly creeping into the narrative to tell indirectly an abbreviated version of Ben's own war story. Innocence lost, experience gained, pride in service, battlefield regrets, doubts, frustrations, and successes, a sense of loss, war nostalgia, and the lifelong comradeship of the battlefield. So join me now in welcoming back to Wabash author Ben Kessling. And a warning to his Sigma Chi brothers out there, no heckling, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out, and uh, you're welcome for um, me keeping Bill Maher from ever returning back this time. <laughs> yeah, so, I know, I know. Um, well, I've been here all day, I've spoken to some classes, um, and, and, and had, a f had a few talks already. Uh, I can't say how much I appreciate coming back to Wabash, and uh, I've said, I said this a little earlier, I don't, you don't recognize, you don't recognize how important it is to, to come home uh, until you return back home, right? And see how much things have changed, and how much they've stayed the same, and how much things have just, things just are, uh, and they develop over time. And I think that um, reporting, uh, reporting about Bravo Company, this group of, this group of soldiers, who deployed to Afghanistan in 2009, had a harrowing deployment, and then came home and have had, had, to, had to reckon with that, um, shows that homecomings are, they're, sometimes they're easy, sometimes they're hard, but they're always, they're, they're, they're never as, as they seem, or as they should be, or as you want them to be. They just are. So, I wrote about, I, I first found Bravo Company uh, when I was writing about their reunion they did in, t in t 2019. They did a, uh, they had a, a, a reunion called Operation Resiliency. They came back together 10 years after their deployment to Afghanistan because that deployment was so harrowing. Uh, they lost, uh, they, they lost a, few, a few men on that deployment. Uh, uh, about a dozen people lost limbs through amputations uh, from IEDs. And nearly 50% of the company received purple hearts. Um, well, they came home, and for the decade after that, they um, continued to, ha to have to fight that war um, after they took off the uniform. And by the time I met them in 2019, they'd had su two suicides, a few attempts, and people who had admitted thinking about it. So the VA and a veteran service organization brought them together for a reunion to see if, by bringing everybody back together and recreating that team, that brotherhood, if that could, if that could, um, that could do something. And, and it did do something. Since then, there's been no suicides in Bravo Company, thank God, uh, and the men have stayed connected together. And um, I followed them after I wrote about them for the paper, and I realized that the entire trajectory of their story was something that needed to be told, and, uh, and I really wanted to tell it. So they let, me, they let me be part of their lives and their family's lives for a few years, and were very frank and forthright, and uh, it was a great honor. So I wrote this book, Bravo Company, and I want to read a couple passages to y'all and then, um, and then uh, take questions because the, there, there, there are a couple goals with writing this. One is to make, one is to make combat and the, veteran, and the veteran life accessible to a civilian population who know, who know nothing about it, who are not conversant with any aspect of it. So if you know nothing about war or about the Army, 
This is a book you can read and learn about that. Likewise, if you've been there, this can serve as a, a way to help you um, see your own story, maybe better understand the things that you went through while you were in combat and, um, and the things that you're going through once you've returned. So um, I'm going to start with something I reckon a little lighthearted, um, if there's uh, some lighthearted stuff from this book. So this company, they, they went to Afghanistan. They were supposed to go to Iraq. They got diverted and went to Afghanistan. Um, just, just before they were supposed to deploy. And they started their deployment by going on a training mission. So they trained Afghan, Afghan police and Afghan soldiers. But then about halfway through that deployment, they got a mission change. And they went to the Argandab Valley in Kandahar. And from that time on, they faced a continual, uh, a continual pressure and anxiety of of, of IEDs buried in the ground. They very rarely had firefights with the Taliban. What they did have was IEDs over and over again. And it got to the point, uh, at a certain point in the deployment, where no one knew if they were going to step on one, who was going to step on one, and who would be next. So I want to read you a little, a little thought, of thoughts that go through, go through somebody's head when they're in the middle of this sort of a deployment. <clears throat> it got to the point for Bravo where they joke before every patrol about who'd it be that day to step on an IED. They joked because they had to. They'd say to each other, look man, if I get blown up and lose a leg, don't try to save me. It seemed funny in the moment, but there was no way to know how serious a guy was when he said it. They never imagined the weight it heaped on their buddies, the guys next to them. What if a guy did lose a leg? What's his buddy supposed to do? Is he supposed to honor that jokey pledge that some 19-year-old kid said as he stepped out on patrol and tried to sound tough? Was that a real request? Or is his buddy supposed to realize that it's just a leg, man, and that joke is a joke? Does he let him bleed out, or does he save him? Of course he saves him when the time comes. He saves him. But either way, either way after a while, that conundrum solved itself because more and more legs were lost. While legs were lost, lives were saved because, of course, that's what a buddy does. Joke pledges be damned. As legs were lost, guys started reevaluating things. Pledges and promises evolved. They started to say, man, if I get blown up and lose both legs, don't try to save me. But after a while, two legs gone didn't seem so bad. So they'd say, man, if I get blown up and I lose my dick, don't try to save me. That one never changed. <laughs> the dick is a sacred piece of army gear that no soldier can imagine losing. Even the balls are somewhat expendable. A guy would prefer to keep those, of course, but losing nuts isn't in the same league as getting his dick blown off. Fuck that. No way. You can always joke about losing a ball or two, but dickless, no sir. If a fellow loses a leg, or even two of them, he could still get some carbon fiber blades and run around like Oscar Pistorius, that South African Olympian, Olympian. He might even stay in the army if he wanted. That was a real option back then. Back then you'd see soldiers on fake legs, still on active duty, walking around base, some looking like they were trying, looking like they were trying to hula hoop while balancing on a waterbed. By 2010, a legless soldier could get prosthetics with a set of flippers attached if he wanted to go scuba diving. He'd cinch on a cleat to a separate one if he wanted to play some softball, and all of them free through Walter Reed. Truth to tell, down deep, in a place only a soldier himself knows, he might even say, no, there's no way he could say it, not out loud. He'd think quietly to himself, shit, a missing leg would be rock-solid proof of my bona fides. It'd prove I'd been there. Man, I might even get some free beers at Applebee's. That fantasy beer would then lead, lead to dreams of getting laid. It might be easy pickings with the ladies, using that peg leg badge of honor for everyone to see at the bar. Free beers, maybe a couple of appetizers, and everyone at the bar staring at that leg of his, just imagining how he lost it. Oh, let them imagine the worst. Civilians and rear echelon motherfuckers. Oh, baby, how they would stare at it. PTSD, PTSD, TBI, and all the rest. That 
doesn't really register in a young soldier's mind when thinking about the consequences of war. But who's got time to worry about all that? On top of all those free Bud Lights and tater skins, there would be that holy grail, a pension from the Department of Defense. Healthcare from the VA. Ha ha, now that would be living. And he might think to himself, pants? He'd never have to wear pants again. He could be like that double amputee veteran senator who rolled around Washington in a wheelchair. Or the guy in Congress walking around in a suit on Capitol Hill, but with no pants. The guy wore shorts with the suit, which meant that everyone could see his prosthetics as he limped around the Capitol. That was the way to do it, man. Pants would hide from the goddamn civilians that glorious carbon fiber prosthetic at the bottom of his stump that he was already dreaming about. In his mind's eye, some crusty Vietnam vet at one end of the bar would give him a knowing wink and a nod of the head. Same time, in his mind's eye, at the other end of the bar, there would be some other veteran having a drink. Yeah, a, a pussy-ass pogue veteran who would just stare ashamedly at that sweet stump. Ha, no free wings or jalapeno poppers for that asshole. <laughs> but wait, this dreamer might think, a guy might lose more than a leg. It's not like he's got it in writing from the Taliban that they'll just take a foot or something. Yeah, maybe on second thought, it's best just not to step on an IED at all. A fellow can't guarantee it's just a leg after all. He might get killed, or worse, a blown off dick and balls. And a dude like that isn't picking up chicks at the bar. No way, no how. Not a good trade-off for free appetizers. A soldier... If he has to make a deal with, the cosmic real with, with cosmic reality, make a deal with God, well, a lost leg is the deal to make, and no way an arm. Oh, shit, losing an arm would be awful. A missing leg looks cool, but a guy missing an arm just like some, looks like some charity case out of a World War I scrapbook. A guy can't do basic shit without an arm, right? Can't even wipe his ass properly. Besides, how would you get an arm blown off anyway? with IEDs buried in the ground so close to the feet and legs? Well, it can happen. Anything can happen in war. Because there's no deal-making with the Taliban. There's no deal-making with cosmic reality. And there's no deal-making with God. So, um, that's, uh, I mean, that's really the sort of, of, of musings that, that a soldier has in a combat zone. Uh, and it's... Uh, it's pretty amazing the, uh, the, the shit that people think of and dream up when they're, when they're getting ready to, to, to patrol through, through a, a god-awful place, the things that they use to, um, to get through it, um, either through joking or rationalization or, 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 or anything else of the matter. Um, so... S these men didn't just have to worry about bombs buried in the ground. Um, one of the men in the book, uh, his name is Alan Thomas. And Alan, he figures as a central character in this book, and he weaves his way through, weaves his way through it. And um, his story is uh, <coughs> his, his story is uh, is an incredible one. And I hope that you'll 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 read about it uh, in the book. Um, but I want to uh, I want to read about a way that Alan got injured. He got injured by a suicide bomber. And he was injured on patrol. They were, on a, they were on a patrol one day, and uh, they set up a vehicle checkpoint. And at that checkpoint, they also had people walking through it. And the whole purpose of this checkpoint was just to kind of show, show, you know, show everybody that they, were, that they were in town, making sure there wasn't freedom of movement, whatnot. And the problem with setting up a checkpoint is that you might have to make a decision at that checkpoint. And making a decision in a combat zone is not as easy as it appears on television. Um, on television, if you're a cop, all the robbers have on black stripy shirts and the face mask and a bag of loot, and so you know who they are. And if you're a soldier, all the bad guys have on uniforms of the other, of the other side. All, uh, all the bad guys have on, they look awful, and you know, how to, you know when to shoot at them. But in reality, it's not so easy. And there's this other young soldier named Jordan Flake. Jordan Flake, he was very close to, uh, at, the, at this checkpoint, 
when he saw a, an Afghan man walking towards, towards them. And the guy was a little bit off, but he couldn't quite figure out what it was about him. And so he took a moment to decide how to react to that man. And this is what follows. <clears throat> a suicide vest doesn't really explain what bombers use. That's a sterile term. It makes it sound like it's part of a three-piece suit. It's easier to understand if you list the parts, if you open it up and look into its guts. Start with inch thick, inch thick slabs of explosive that often look and feel like modeling clay, cold and gray. That's typically shaped into a rectangle the size of a coffee table book. Nothing more detailed or defined than an elementary school art project. Then likely come the industrial ball bearings, dense steel the size of marbles. They're laid out in a mosaic. The quarter inch shiny metal balls are arranged next to each other in a geometric pattern, like tiny grout tiles on a floor, or on the walls of a church, or on the floor of a mosque. The whole thing is then wrapped up in clear packing tape to keep it all together. And somewhere in all that is woven a detonation cord and a blasting cap, a tiny bit of explosive attached to a trigger that makes it go off. This is its anatomy, simple and lethal. And such a vest might even be wired up so that a cord runs down a bomber's leg, connecting to a button on his kneecap. That way he doesn't have to use his hands to hit a trigger. He can just fall to his knees. Now that is smart stuff, because then he can put his hands up and take a step closer to his target. The man took a step forward and he raised his hands. He took another step, and he mumbled, Allahu Akbar. In that moment, when the young man mumbled Allahu Akbar, nothing was determined. Jordan Flake was a young American in an uncertain place, watching another young man who had walked toward him. And now the man had his hands up, a fellow human being. In that moment, Flake could have made a choice. In theory, he could have changed the progress of history exerted his free will on the situation. Shoot or don't shoot. But as that moment, unstoppable, slid by, there was so much to calculate. There's something deep within a soldier's breast, fundamental to a person like Flake's very nature. There are those who have dark souls, bad men moving among us, but we must believe in a fundamental goodness in ourselves and in those we interact with. If we lose hope in that, we might as well give up on the project of life itself. We must believe in the good. For a soldier like Jordan Flake, that goodness was as much a part of him as his soul, unchanging and pure. It was the unflinching human love that lies within us all. That was the thing that was deep within Flake in that moment, where he was trying to make a decision to end another human's life. It was the divine. The infinite held in a passing moment, the very breath of God swirled around Jordan Flake, reminding him that the young Afghan in front of him, too, was a man. Or perhaps Flake just didn't act, simple as that. Who's to say? As is the case with any suicide bomber, every step closer they can get increases the odds of the explosion. The ball bearings will find their mark. Those ball bearings are indiscriminate in their destruction. Their goal, simply to do as much damage as possible to whatever human is in their path. Their mark is anyone. And there's no rhyme or reason in their path of flight. Just like with a shotgun, the chance of hitting the target diminishes the further you get from it. The suicide bomber's bet is that there are so many ball bearings that the odds are pretty good at least one of them will find a target. Especially if he can take a step closer and another step closer and another. Suicide bombers prey on the better angels of our nature. Suicide bombers know the flakes of the world. They know they will see the eyes of another human being, of a brother made in God's image. Perhaps they have that goodness buried deep within them too, and thus know how to exploit it. Is that too presumptuous to try to get into the mind of a suicide bomber? If so, 
than despite any intent they have in their minds. The reality is that they can and they do play upon those tender mercies. And Flake, seeing that image of God coming toward him, thought nothing could be lost by taking his time. Everything could be lost by rushing to fire his rifle. That strange Afghan man, Flake later found out, was yelling at the Afghan policemen that were around them, saying he desperately needed something. He needed to get through the checkpoint, please, because his wife and child were sick. Please, he begged. His pleas came tumbling out as he stepped closer and closer. Suicide bombers look into a young soldier's eyes and take full advantage of those mystic cords of memory. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. So the young soldier waits a moment. A precious child of God himself, Flake did not, he could not, level his rifle and shoot the Afghan. That delay, that moment of humanity, comes back to Flake again and again even now. Or rather, he goes back to it, unstuck in time. He waited. The Holy Spirit itself staying his trigger finger and the tremblingly awful life-ending act he was contemplating. In memory, in hindsight, he knows his delay let the bomber get closer. The delay to consider this Afghan's life put himself in deadly danger. It put his friends in deadly danger. Flake risked death in order to not risk sullying his humanity. The calculations are not easy, and they have to be done quickly before that fleeting free will moment passes. Why couldn't Flake have done it differently? In that moment of sympathy and empathy and trust, and in that moment of delay, that precious Afghan child of God, the one wearing a suicide vest, went to his knees. Boom. Um, so in a, in a combat zone, we, we learn that, um, we learn that time is elastic, right? Um, and this is something that Kurt Vonnegut tries to teach us in Slaughterhouse-Five, right? Um, and anybody who thinks that book is a work of science fiction is bonkers, because that's a, that's a work of, of history, because it tells quite well what a moment in time can do. It can expand and contract. Think about, uh, think about the last time you uh, you've went over the handlebars of your bicycle or were in a car wreck or got hit in the face with a baseball. Uh, that moment took forever, right? You know that that moment is more than a moment. And that's the way moments are for, for, for people in a combat zone. Another thing that, that Vonnegut taught us is that you have in a certain way, an inability to control when you go back to revisit those moments. And poor Jordan Flake has no control over, the, over when he becomes unstuck in time and gets ripped back to that moment when he didn't pull the trigger. Now that explosion, one of those ball bearings found its way into his friend, Alan Thomas's chest, and cut through his flak jacket, went through a lung, and skittered down his back like a hot pachinko marble, leaving a trail uh, down his back. And Alan, he didn't, um, he didn't recover fully from that. Um, I'll, tol- I'll talk a little bit more about Alan uh, in, in a moment. Um, okay. How about something a little more lighthearted-ish? So, we are told that the Medal of Honor, if you, if, if you say the Medal of Honor is won, like somebody, somebody won the Medal of Honor, you're going to get your ass chewed, right? Because nobody wins the Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor is awarded. Well, I have another section about amusing on the Medal of Honor, and I think that this, is, uh, this, this sums up some thinking of, of a, of a guy I cover named Rob Muscle. How about that for a last name of a soldier? Um, Rob Muscle, he, uh, he loves going to combat because he's good at it. And um, something, that, uh, something that people who love going to combat also think about is inevitability of, of an award at some point being, being a possibility. Uh, but it's not something that you can speak aloud. That's verboten. So anyway, I'm going to talk a little about 
Rob Mussel. I call Rob Mussel high priest of war because he respects the craft so much that he, uh, he doesn't want to sully it in any way. Uh, and I, I, before, before this section, I muse a little bit about uh, whether or not you want somebody who takes war extraordinarily seriously and has made a profession of it representing you in a combat zone. Do you want, is that a warmonger? Somebody who's gonna like, uh, gonna take war uh, in directions you don't want to go? Or is it someone who finds it so sanctified that they don't want to, they don't want to sully its purity? Um, I don't have an answer to that. But this is, uh, this is a little bit about, uh, about Rob Mussel. As a high priest of war, Mussel knew there was one pure, holy, and most supreme thing that all his many deployments had yet to reveal to him, a warrior's grail. Some select soldiers, or marines, will admit, sometimes when they're sober, sometimes only when blinded with drink, that the most great, the most gracious, and the most godly way to leave this earth would be getting killed while in the middle of actions that win them the Medal of Honor the grandest military decoration the United States can bestow upon a service member. That's the only thing that would be really righteous. Now, Muscle caveats any discussion of medals of valor by saying he's never wanted one. He's never sought one out and never hoped for one. It's blasphemy to even seek such things. And anyone with such hopes is not a soldier for the proper reasons, he argues. Accepting the possibility of death even preferring to die in a gunfight rather than from natural causes, elderly and alone, is a more accurate depiction of his stoic approach. Now that being said, even while talking about getting such a medal as improper, profane, and verboten, there is still the reality of it all that should be examined. A few things to begin with. First of all, there are too many people who have read the Associated Press Style Guide, that paragon of proscribing rather than describing the English language, who will tell you that the Medal of Honor is not won, it is awarded. Scolds will get indignant and remind a fellow that to talk about winning the Medal of Honor is an insult to all who have been awarded it. Well, anyone who knows anything knows sure as shit that a medal like that is won. And it's a great and glorious prize for, who, for he who wins it. Too bad the odds of ever winning it are stacked against the lowly infantryman dreaming of glory. It's a crapshoot roulette game of chance that even gets you deployed to the right place at the right time to get you into combat. Yeah, sure, you can join the infantry and will likely get yourself with deployment, but you could get the shitty end of the stick and get stuck for months on some training mission down in Helmand. Hell, if you're a Marine, you can get stuck floating around on a stupid ship for an entire deployment. If you're in the Army, you might get stuck on the DMZ in Korea picking your ass for months at a time. It's a minor jackpot just to get out on patrol in a combat zone in the first place. Then you have to roll the cosmic dice just right to get to where there's fighting. Plenty of people go through a combat deployment and never get to pull the trigger. It's always possible that one squad out of a platoon will get into a marvelous shoot 'em up firefight and the rest of them won't see anything worthwhile. Ah but you might have royal flush type luck and find yourself in a place where the odds are stacked against you and the enemy is coming in a wave and you have a chance to do some shit that they'll read about in books for years to come. You might have the great and good fortune to be in a situation where you know you're probably going to die as the enemy advances and as you mow down a few in the meantime. That might be bad news for most people, but for true high priests of war, that would be fantastic. That's the biggest jackpot of them all, as far as the odds go, to put a guy in position to win the big one, the Medal of Honor. Now, yes, it's true that in those defining moments, there's no luck involved or random chance. During those frantic minutes, such a medal is purely earned. That singular moment of glory is yours, hard-earned, no question about it. If you do some stuff that's top-notch, Grade A, movie caliber glory, it's all yours. Maybe you advance on a machine gun. Maybe you smash a guy's face in with your boot. In that few minutes, maybe a few hours, everyone can agree that you've done what it takes to earn that grail. But after that fight, then what? It's not like you automatically get the Medal of Honor. The soldier in the fighting hole next to you can't pen a medal on you. Your great and good luck must continue in order for you to cash in your winnings. Who knows if anybody saw what you did? 
or maybe your staff sergeant thinks you're a cocky asshole and won't testify on your behalf even though you saved half the platoon, including his sorry ass. Maybe your CO hates your guts and the XO is a bad writer and can't describe well what you did, or maybe he's just too lazy to do the paperwork. And who knows if the generals and the chief of staff and the secretary of the army don't care about you or simply have other stuff to focus on. Maybe they don't want to spend their political capital on some Medal of Honor nomination right now. Maybe they're worried about getting a budget approved. And the Secretary of Defense and the President? Well, either of them might be turds. They both might be turds. And in that case, you've rolled snake eyes at the big casino of valor. In that case, you don't win jack shit. Yeah, maybe you'll get a bronze star with a V for valor, or even a silver star. Maybe a distinguished service cross. But you don't win the big one. You don't win the one that gets you a lifetime stipend from the federal government and trips to presidential inaugurations and Fourth of July celebrations and speaking engagements. You don't get the medal that dictates even four-star motherfucking generals have to salute you. No shit. If you got the Medal of Honor, everybody has to salute you, no matter your rank, according to tradition. The stars must align for it. What you earn in those moments of unknowably awful and valorous glory is just to put the ante on the table in hopes of the big win. And high priests, whether they say it out loud or not, they want that medal. But maybe they don't want to be above ground when that medal is awarded. It's much easier for the Pentagon to give that thing to a guy who was blended into bits while saving his buddies than a guy who survived the ordeal. Hmm. Say, how'd that guy make it out of all that alive if he gave it his all? Sounds kind of fishy, don't it? The washed up assholes down at the local VFW bar who were fucking engine mechanics back in their day will mumble into their beers. Ah, oh, Jesus, have you seen some of the guys who are still alive and have the medal? Have you seen the guys who don't even have the big one? The poor saps with the distinguished service crosses? Some of those guys have wispy holes in their heads in lieu of eyeballs. A stare that goes somewhere. Maybe back to that place where one of them, I don't know, maybe clubbed a man to death with an entrenching tool? Nah. It's no good to be a broken ex-combatant, a museum piece. It's no good to end up some drooling old fart they lash to a gurney and put out on the street for all to see on the 4th of July. No, the way to do it is to go out and be remembered just like that. Then you win, and you win big. The AP style guide can kiss both cheeks because that's the reality of it. And that's what a guy like Rob Muscle wants more than anything. Not only do you get glory, not only do you win big, but you never have to deal with anything anymore. You're out. You're gone. You're in Valhalla, welcomed upon your arrival as a true and proper high fucking priest of war. So uh, this is a section I, I read when I was back for the Big Bash. I don't know how many people were here for that. Um, but it's a section I think just, I think it tells, I think it tells a lot in a, in a relatively short section. Um, in this section, Joey Karen, a soldier with um, Bravo Company, uh, has stepped over, a, stepped over a mud wall and stepped down on an IED. And once he stepped on the IED, uh, he was eviscerated. And Joey Karen, um, Joey Karen died uh, on that deployment. And uh, I talked to his dad, Jeff Karen, and this is what we talked about. <sighs> Back in Tacoma, Washington, Jeff Karen was sitting at home on what seemed like a regular old Sunday. His wife, Joey's stepmom, looked out the window and told Jeff two soldiers were coming up the front walk. They were in dress uniforms. Jeff's first thought was to send his daughter to play in the other room. First things first. He knew it was coming and he was ready for it. Then he went to the door. I'd hoped never to meet you, he said to the female officer at the door in her well-pressed uniform. We'd hope never to meet you, she replied. Everyone was all business. There was hardly a need for the soldiers to tell Jeff the news at this point. They told him anyway. And then the officer asked him if he wanted to let the media know about his son's death. Jeff told him Joey 
hadn't just been his son. He'd been America's son. So please, by all means, let the media know about it. Jeff already knew that he'd have to go to the Air Force Base in Dover, Delaware, the port of entry for the remains of the war dead of the United States of America. He was already making plans in his head. Jeff realized later that he'd all but ignored his wife and Joey's sister during this because he wanted to be professional about it. He wanted to handle it like a soldier. Looking back on it, he was too professional, almost cold. After all, Jeff himself wasn't a soldier on official business. He's no, he was no longer in the 101st Airborne. He was a father learning about the fate of his son. Jeff flew to Dover, and he took along Joey's grandfather. And they stayed on the third floor, the top floor, of that Holiday Inn Express there by the base. Now this was back in 2010, back in the middle of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And at the time, the third floor of that Holiday Inn was reserved for family members waiting for their loved one's remains to arrive at Dover. It must have been a hell of a thing for folks staying on the first or second floors of that Holiday Inn. Just regular paying customers, Jeff said. Imagine, just trying to enjoy your trip to Dover while all these weeping, sad people shuffled around above you. It was a hotel with an attic full of ghosts, he said. Then they headed over to the base to wait for Joey's plane. The hangar they waited in was the oddest thing, Jeff remembers. The massive space was filled with all these living room sets in different styles and configurations. It was like a furniture showroom. Grieving families could pick out the spot where they'd feel most comfortable sitting and waiting for a dead son or a dead daughter. <laughs> Do we want modern and sleek couches, maybe? Perhaps something more traditional. Well, they sat in their airplane hangar living room, and an army general showed up and joined Jeff. She came to pay her respects as the high-ranking representative of the Pentagon, there for the families and for the fallen soldier. She walked over to Jeff, introduced herself, and Jeff said she should take a seat and put herself at ease. Let him tell her about Joey. Well, that general had some major with her, an aide, and for a second that major thought Jeff had given the general a command, had told the general at ease, and that major sputtered and about swooned from the perceived impropriety. And Jeff still laughs about it when he thinks about it. Asking the general to have a seat was extraordinary enough. It wasn't often that parents extended such an invitation. Most of the time, parents cried and they yelled and they blamed the general for the soldier's death. The general was typically the punching bag for the family's grief, Uncle Sam incarnate. But with Jeff, the general did find herself at ease, and she sat. Jeff wanted to introduce her to his son, their soldier. I said, there's no blame for this, Jeff remembered. Soldiers die, even if they're your son. About 1.30 in the morning, Joey's plane landed, and the brass told Jeff they'd wait until he was ready to start the ceremony, to bring Joey off the plane. Quick like, Jeff said he wanted to get it done. Let's go. The honor guard in their fresh camis and crisp white gloves carry the shining casket flag draped off the back of the plane. Jeff saluted his boy. Then Jeff and Joey's grandfather headed back to Tacoma to wait again. The body still had to be flown out to the West Coast. Jeff got back home in Washington State and started preparing for Joey's final trip home. Joey remained there at Dover for four or five days as the mortuary affairs team prepped his body, dressed him in a new uniform, and then sent him via a Gulfstream jet across the country. They buried Joey in Washington State. Jeff and some friends went up to the casket before they closed it up, and they put some stuff in there that Joey surely needed for the afterlife. That beauty of a Springfield pistol that he had, well, it went into Joey's waistband, as best as they could find a waistband. It was Joey's pistol, after all. He got it fair and square after his enlistment, re-enlistment. They put a fishing pole in the casket next to him, and a fellow needed a new pocket knife, too. So one of those went in. And, of course, a bottle of Patron. And then he was buried. And all that remained of Joey Karen in this world was gone. Now, Joey and Jeff had always promised each other that whoever died first would report back 
from the great beyond somehow, some way. Jeff always said if he went first, he'd make his way to Joey's attic and clink some chains like the ghost of Christmas past or something. Joey never really said how he'd do it, but he told his dad to rest assured that he would. Soon after the funeral, some friends came to visit Jeff, and he took them to Joey's favorite bar. They all had shots of Patron, ordered an extra one in Joey's memory, and then let it sit there on the table for a while until the bartender came over, and she asked with a laugh whether somebody was going to finally drink that last shot. But Jeff told the bartender that it was a shot for his son, his son who'd just died in Afghanistan. And then that nice bartender started to cry. She said she was very sorry. She didn't know. Jeff told her not to be sad. Don't be sorry. Joey's death was just something that happened. Ashes to ashes. He handed that nice bartender the shot and told her she should drink it at the end of her shift. It would be a fitting tribute to Joey. She thanked him and saved the shot for later, and then she handed Jeff his bar tab, and it was $101 exactly. 101. That's the first time Jeff Karen started to see the number 101. And he realized, damned if old Joey just might be clanking those, gas, those ghostly chains from the great beyond. He was the type of guy to have the last laugh on his dad, the old 101st Division Army veteran, by screwing around with him like this. And that number 101 began to pop up all the time. When Jeff and his wife did the calculation, they realized Joey died on the 101st day of the year. Soon after that, Jeff went to check out a house he was thinking of buying up in the woods. He'd be using some of Joey's life insurance money for it, and when he parked the car at the front door of that prospective new house, the trip odometer read 101 miles. Jeff decided to buy the house then and there. Didn't even need to look inside. Jeff's happy to talk about 101 following him around ever since Joey's death. But he's sure to explain it, so it doesn't seem like he's become an astrologist or some Kabbalistic numerologist. Jeff will give a little laugh like he knows there's no way it's real. He won't say he takes it as conclusive proof that Joey's still around in some way, but finding those little 101 breadcrumbs scattered through life makes him feel as if Joey's still there. It's comforting to me, he said. It doesn't matter if it's scientifically real or not. It's just a comfort. But shit, who's to say it isn't Joey? After all, the father and son made a pact to report back from the afterlife, and Joey was never one to break his word. So, I want to read one more section. Very short, I promise. Um, we talked about, I talked about Alan Thomas a little earlier. Alan was a strapping paratrooper, 250-pound guy. Um, and then he got hit with that ball bearing from that suicide vest, went through his lung, and he was sent back to Walter Reed for immediate recuperation, and he started to recover. But he was very weak um, and had trouble getting around. He was hooked up to a bunch of tubes, drains, valves, wires, all that stuff that you get when you're, when you're in the hospital. Um, and this is a section that um, I have, people who are in this book um, have told me that they think that this may, may be this, the sort of distilled essence of what they want, what they want somebody to, to, to know about war what they want leaders to know before people are sent to war. And it's the thing that I, when, I give, when I give a general this book, I tell them I want them to read these couple paragraphs. And um, I'm trying to, uh, trying to find my way to present a copy of this to, um, to, to somebody at the White House. And, uh, and if I do, this is what I want to read. Um, because I think this is, this is the stuff that, I mean, this is war. Eventually, he was able to get around, to move with a walker slowly, and then he could stand up and shuffle to the bathroom. The indignities that a wounded man must suffer are legion, and though they seem, objectively speaking, to be embarrassments and insults to his very nature, they are not so. 
Wounds are the simple wages of war. They are what happens when a man pushes his entire stack of life's chips out on the table for a bet to go where others dare not, and the Taliban croupier takes them all away from him. Alan's body and mind there at Walter Reed were the result of an upside-down wager. But he was bold enough to make that bet, goddammit, and that's more than most can say for themselves. So what are we, mere bystanders at the casino, to think and feel after we see what happens to this sort of man? What are we to think of the night Alan went to sleep and the tubes and drain valves and wires connected to his body got all jumbled and tangled so that when he needed to go to the bathroom, he couldn't move. What are we to think about how he, Sergeant Alan Thomas of the 82nd Airborne, made an accident in his bed? This is not something Alan ever wanted to talk about. It's not something his wife Danica ever wanted to talk about. And yet it happened. And it happened to others. It happened in the past, and it will happen in the future because this is life, and this is war, and it's enraging, and it's pathetic, and it's noble, and it's sad, and it's tragic, and it's life in all its glory and in all its shame. It's life. It's life. It's life. A grown man messing his bed is something we should be forced to face, unblinking. When we think of patriotism, it's not the Veterans Day parades, the Memorial Day celebrations, the Fourth of July backyard picnics we should focus on. Yeah, sure, all those things are well and good. But we should also be forced to think of Sergeant Alan Thomas and of the many noble warriors like him who come home from war to soil their hospital beds. For those closest to him, Alan wetting his bed was an embarrassment. For the rest of us, it was and ever will remain an attestation, an exemplification, and even a holy tribute. Do not look away from him in his apparent shame. That this strong rock and steady timber of American youth should be cracked and broken and piss his bed is beyond what we can ever hope to understand about what it means to go to war. Thank you. So Ben said he'd take a, a few questions. There's going to be a reception afterward, and he'll be signing books. So, anybody have anything? If not, that's okay. <laughs> so, how difficult was it to get people to talk to you in this book? Um. To get people to start talking is difficult, but once they start talking, they want to talk. And I think that anybody who, anybody who, inter who interviews um, or is a counselor or just as a good friend knows that when someone makes space for you to tell your story, when someone makes space to listen and hear and understand, then people talk. Because like, um, I'm a journalist during my day job, and I cover tragedies, I cover shootings, and disasters, and horrible hate crimes, and things like that. And oftentimes I'm the first person to get a hold of a, uh, of a family member. There's times when that happens. And I know that there's sometimes um, a, a, a feeling, a perception that journalists should just leave, leave people alone, like they've gone through enough, uh, and, and uh, you know, don't, you, should, you shouldn't be calling them and asking about this stuff. But my experience is that people want to talk about these things. They want to talk about momentous occasions that they've gone through 
um, they want to talk about traumas because they want, to, they want them to be heard about. They want them to be remembered, and they want meaning to be made of them. And when talking to veterans and talking to the men of Bravo Company and their family members, um, people wanted to talk because they want, that, they want the story to live on in some way, whether or not it's because it's written down or just because another person knows it and somehow passes that along. Um, they want to talk. There's a question back there. Well, um, so how to keep, uh, how, to, how to make sure that, um, how, how for troops to remain sort of uh, serious about the gravity of what they do? Um, Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I talk about that in, in a section um, in here about how uh, the company commander is a West Point graduate, um, Captain Adam Armstrong. And there's no class at West Point that teaches the, the, the gravity of war in this way, right? Like we learn about, we learn about the, the, the sort of the weight of war and what it's, you know, what it's like to lead to lead men and women in combat. Uh, people who go to West Point, they learn about, um, you know, we as, we as officers in the Marine Corps or whatever, we learn about these things. People who go to West Point, they learn about how, uh, how to motivate soldiers, how to get them to do, their, to do their duty and do their jobs and stuff. But there's, um, there's a, a, long has been an uh, um, omission in the area of sort of the effect, the ultimate effect of combat on folks. And I think that there's uh, a couple things, and there's a couple things to that. One is, if we let people know about the ultimate effect of combat before they went into it, it'd scare the bejesus out of them, they wouldn't go. Um, I think that's a big part of it, right? Um, you don't want people crapping their pants before they have to go on their first mission because they're so scared. You want them confident and ready to go fight. Uh, and I also think that if we taught leaders of they're the enduring duty that they have toward the men and women under their command and to society, it'd scare the bejesus out of them. And they might not be prepared to, to take, to shoulder those, to shoulder that demand. Um, I think that we should do more to teach, to teach about um, the, 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 the real emotional and physical toll of war. But I don't think we ever will because unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, I don't know, um, to humanize war too much is to create inefficient, is to create inefficient fighters to some extent. At least that's the mentality some folks might have. Yes, sir. I think that a lot of people think that, yeah. Um, but I think that there's a, um, I don't think that they're necessarily are, um, irreconcilable. I think that there's, um, I think there's a deep need to have a, um, to have true, a true humanism and uh, a true, a true human approach to going to combat and understanding that. And I think that, yeah, we might not have caricatures of, we might not have caricatures of soldiers that we see on, full metal jacket or something, but we would have soldiers who could still fight effectively when they need to, 
and who could also know how to deal humanely with people when they need to. Um, I think that that's a real possibility, and it's something that we, as a society and as, as an armed forces, need to think about. Anybody who says that, you know, this generation's softer than the last one's full of shit. I mean, um, y you know, uh, since, since Roman ages, uh, old assholes have been complaining about the mores and tempores, right? Like, the kids these days are weak. And that's not the case, no. It's, um, I guarantee anybody from, from it's all, there's, there's always, in the Marine Corps we talk about the old corps, right? Ah, I miss the old corps. What, what are you talking about? There was no old corps. There never was an old corps. Like, that's nostalgia. Um, there, there just is. And, um, and I think that by giving, giving a humane education to people can actually, you know, I, I think can make them, can make them better war fighters. Uh, especially officers. I wish I would have, I wish I would have um, had even more of an education in, uh, in, in other, peop other people's cultures, other people's beliefs, other people's traditions um, when I went over there. And I had a pretty, pretty damn good grounding. Um, so, but I don't know. Good luck getting the E-ring at the Pentagon to do that, right? <laughs> Last question. Last question. Don't, <laughs> don't screw it up. Yes, that is, uh, thank you for asking that. Um, and it kind of goes, it, it goes a bit to the heart of, the, of, of this project and why, why, you know, ultimately saw fit to write um, about these guys instead of myself, right? And I've, I've talked about this a little bit uh, before, is um, who's the most interesting person in your life? It's you, right? Like, <laughs> you're the most interesting dude in the planet, right? And when you're at the bars and you're drinking beers and everybody's telling their stupid stories, you're like, oh, if I should I would shut up so I can tell my story about me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, that is often a failing of, uh, of war literature, I think, because it quickly descends into, into memoir or into telling, telling uh, you know, fishing stories uh, where the bluegill ends up this big that I caught, you know? And... When, when, we, when we devolve into telling memoir and trying to tell our own story, we can lose sight of, uh, of, of what matters in the story. And I think by me telling, you know, an army company story, I was able to tell, uh, I was able to, it, it's, it's someone else. I'm telling their story, and I'm staying out of it, purposefully staying out of it, because it's not my story. And if I told my story, it would just be another bullshit bar story. It wouldn't be this. Um, now, my, my background allows me to tell that story effectively, I think. And I think of myself, so when a unit goes overseas, they have, um, they have an interpreter with them. They don't have a translator, they have an interpreter. Because a translator would just look up a word in the dictionary and look up the other one and the other one and, hey, that's what it means. But that's not what they do. No, they interpret the word to make sure that it is the right one. It's got the, the, the proper cultural context, the proper, um, the proper intonations, tones, and whatnot. And I think that because of my background, I'm able to be an interpreter for Bravo Company story and tell their story with fidelity and truth and, um, and no, no falsehoods. It's, I mean, this is all uh, reporting and nonfiction, but I'm able to tell it in a way that somehow brings 
brings a, um, brings a fidelity and a, a liveliness and, and a depth to it that you can't do just by uh, asking some folks a bunch of questions and then transcribing it. So I think that's where that, that comes. And um, I, I had a bunch of people tell me, hey, like, where are you in this book? You know, like, what the hell? Uh, we get to the end of this thing and there's, you, you didn't talk about yourself at all. You, you gotta say something. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll put an author's note in the back, but it's after everything's done because I don't wanna be in this narrative. And um, I'm gonna read the last just three paragraphs of the book, because that's the end of the author's note. <coughs> so, um, actually, I'm going to read a little bit more. You got time? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. <clears throat> Through years of interviewing others about their experiences, I address my own feelings, many yet unspoken, as if I had been on a therapist's couch. I hope my sincerity of effort comes through in these pages, and that when others read this, they gain solace by it and use their resolution to comfort others. I hope this book is like a batch of sourdough, the original version fermenting away as parts of it are taken for future batches, better batches, I hope. Writing this book made me, and there's a sadness in what I'm about to say, so bear with me, it made me more deeply realize all the things I could have done better in my life. It laid bare all the mistakes and misgivings and errors I need to atone for, and my need for redemption. I think we'd be better off in our lives and as a species if we were all honest about such matters. But recognizing those many past failings, and ah, here is a great happiness, it opened the door to true redemption, to making a better future beginning right now. There's no telos in war or society, no definite end state everything moved toward, but perhaps there's a telos for each and every one of us. Perhaps there's a, a good life that we're supposed to move toward, like flowing water finding its way to where it ought to be. After all these long conversations with Bravo Company veterans, I know one thing for certain. The deepest existential truths only can be revealed through genuine interaction with other people. God evinces the divine in our fellow humans, and we better pay attention to such power wherever it manifests. It takes other people to let us look more deeply at ourselves. It takes others to help us interpret and to understand what we've gone through and what we're going through. In other words, we need other people in our lives in order to call us out on our bullshit. Likewise, we need others to praise us for that which we do well but don't give ourselves credit for. My greatest hope is that this book is written so that even the people who are at the events described herein and who described to me their firsthand experiences might be taken to a place they previously didn't know existed and to which they hadn't had any access before. What more can any author hope for? So in the end, what is it all about? What does the experience of war mean? If you think you really know, then you're either a fool or you're full of shit. Eh, that's not true. You may say simply that you are certain it demands that you walk more humbly before your God and fellow man. Thank you.